Acts chapter number 12. We'll break it up a little bit, we'll put one message now, and then we'll have another, some more songs where we worship, and uh, then we'll have another message to close us. But I hope you're open to the Lord working in your heart today. Amen. Amen. For no other reason than gas is five bucks something a gallon. I mean, man, if I'm going to fill that kind of gas up, it's just like, I'm going to get something for it. I'm, go- I'm going somewhere that matters. I'm going, and church matters. Hey, it'll like change your life. Yeah, hey, changed mine, man. That's awesome. Praise the Lord. Yeah. So anyway, uh, but today we're looking and really just being grateful for what God has given us in the tool and power of prayer. Something that is often neglected because we can't, we, we feel like we need to do something. I need to get my little hands in it if, we're, if something's going to be done or else just, I'll just take my toys and go home. But that's not how prayer works. So think of the prayers that have been answered in our church as we start reading. Now I'm going to read the, some verses fast because we want to get through our verses um, and then jump over in Acts 12. But before we read in Acts 12, I'm going to read a few verses out of James 5. Think about these things, what the scripture is saying. Verse number 14 in James 5, he says, Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let him pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Is any sick? Man, do that. And the prayer of the faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another. Pray for one another that ye may be healed. The effectual... Fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are. That's the scripture's way of saying he's messed up too. He's just human. Elijah, Elias, they're they're, they're just people. But look what happened. He prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. So he's just messed up too, and he just sat down and said, Lord, I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray and pray and pray and pray, and earnestly, and what happened? And he prayed again, and it didn't rain. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. I'm going to just talk this morning for a couple minutes on prayers of power. Prayers of power. Let's ask the Lord to bless for a few minutes. Lord, thank you. So much for your goodness. You're so good to us. Lord, help us to recognize this morning that you are the creator. You are everything. Help us to recognize our position and our state this morning. If we've accepted your gift of eternal life, thank you for that. Thank you for Jesus. We couldn't do it by ourselves. We understand that. Lord, for the one who isn't saved this morning, I pray that you would give them the strength to just bow the knee today. And understand they need to put their trust in you for their eternal soul, for eternal life. Lord, thank you for prayers that truly have power. Help us to be people that believe. In Jesus' name, amen. There's little things that can have a huge impact. There are little things that can be life-changing. A negative one can be a splinter. You ever had a splinter that got infected? Well, it can start to hurt. It's just so little, it's just a little thorn. How does that thing start hurting so bad? Little, Little things can have an impact. I feel like we're not on the same page. Do you think little things can have an impact? I feel like I have. I feel like we should have been on the same page with that one, but it's like, I mean... You get a metal shard in your eye. It has a big impact. Hello. Like, all right. Anyway, little things can have a big impact. What we, a little glance to the right, a little glance to the left, a prayer to the Father, little things can have a huge impact. I'll give you an illustration of this and show you. Brother Stu, can we get that picture up there? Now, this was Friday. 
And who all has been impacted by the bridge closure on I-5 coming back? You're coming back north, and they've said it, okay, cool, you've been acting. There's about, there's about three of us that travel south and that have been impacted by the, okay, about three of us travel. Okay, good, good, good. All right. So the, that's the traffic going north on the right-hand side uh, when I was traveling south on the freeway. I was going down to Vancouver, had some business stuff we had to take care of down in Vancouver. I'm going to Vancouver south. The one on the right-hand side in the picture is north, okay? Now, north made sense for it to be shut or, or at least slowed because of the bridge work happening, right? And they put, but why is that side all backed up? Why is that side all messed up? Let me tell you since you asked. All right. So I'm like looking for what's the problem? Like, again, I get they got to work on bridges. I mean, hello, we all are like, why'd the bridge fall down with everybody on it? Because they didn't work on the bridge. So cut them some slack when they're working on the bridge. Right, 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 right. Like, like. So I get that. I get that. Why is the other side all messed up? Well, here's, here's why. I'm driving. I'm looking. I'm like, why are we doing four miles an hour? I just don't get it. Then all of a sudden, I start to see the blue flashing lights. Ah, there must be an accident ahead. Okay, okay, that makes a little bit more sense. But the blue flashing lights are not on our side south. They're on the north side. And so I started looking a little closer, and I see uh, another emergency service vehicle coming. But it's not an ambulance. It's not more police cars. It's not state troopers. It's, uh, it's a wrecker. It's a tow truck. So I see his little lights coming down the freeway. And again, not southbound, northbound. Why are we messed up? Still looking. Okay, the wrecker's coming. And now I'm looking for a car accident, right? Police car, the wrecker, car accident. It's what we're looking for. So while I'm looking for that, I'm like, I don't see a thing. I, I don't see. And then finally, we start getting past the accident. And somebody that was driving like a... Uh, a sport bike has broke down or something else has happened. But anyway, the sport bike needs to be towed is the problem. This thing had to have weighed 300 pounds, 400 pounds. Like in the world of towing cars, not much. I'm like, throw the thing in the back of the truck and let's go. Like, right? I'd be like, you grab that side, George. I'll grab this side. We're out of here. I mean, that's like... But that was south, like, but the problem with the bike was northbound. Why is southbound all messed up? Let me tell you why. Because thousands of people did this. That was it. Thousands of people glanced left and slowed and watched and did and all of a sudden, you put all of these little things together, a split second glance, a quick pump of the brakes, it now backs up thousands and thousands and thousands of people for the negative. <coughs> Thanks, Brother Stu, you can take that down. But brethren, can I submit this to you? That while our lack of focus can contribute to a negative, Little bits of intentionality and focus lead to huge positives. The power of prayer, the Bible says, can save the sick. The power of prayer can heal. The power of prayer changes lives. Let's look in one more place before we close out this part of it this morning. In Acts chapter 12 where you turned over your Bible to. Think of that illustration. Thousands of people did this. And they looked. And it had this huge impact. What if there were a bunch of people that said, we're going to be focused and we're going to pray. And we're going to see something great done for God. Look what happens in Acts chapter 12. Now what's happening in Acts, and remember, Acts is written by Dr. Luke. Dr. Luke likes to write down things specifically as they happen. He's a doctor. He has a doctor's mind. And so he's putting together these different situations that are happening. And right now, they're going through some difficult situations in the church. So we start reading in Acts chapter 12. The Bible says in verse number 1, Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. He don't like this whole church business. This whole King Jesus thing is just, he ain't happy about it. So verse number 2, 
And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. That's a bad day. I mean, we get that announcement this morning. We said, hey, brother so-and-so, he was up in uh, Olympia talking with uh, the state officials, and, and they took out a sword and killed him. Like, okay. All right. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. So just like politicians, he said, okay, all right, well, that worked out for him. got me a few more votes. We'll do it again. Hey, hey. And they grabbed Peter too. Then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended him, Peter, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Now, in a quaternion of soldiers, there's four guys. So there's four of them. So 16 guys for mean old dangerous Peter. <laughs> big bad Peter. Now, maybe big bad Peter in the garden, they were like, ah, we've seen him cut off homie's ear. Like, we ain't take it. But this Peter's a little different. This Peter has changed. This Peter has been like, hey, I'm here to serve the Lord. So, but what Herod wants to do is he wants to make a big point of this thing. So he's like, we're going to get 16 Roman soldiers to bring old big bad Peter in, is what we're doing here. All right, got it. Peter, therefore, verse number five, was kept in prison, but... I mean, so far, we've had a pretty rough opening. We got James being killed by a sword. And these are leaders of the church. These are important guys to the movement. James is killed by the sword. Herod's like, hey, this is good stuff. I mean, can you imagine what would be happening? I mean, we'd be texting, man, James is killed by a sword. We need to do this. We need to adjust to that. We need to figure this out. I mean, this is a problem. And then all of a sudden, somebody else gets grabbed up that's important. Peter's gone. And he's in prison, man. And it's just like, man, what are we going to do? So look what happened. Therefore, Peter was kept in prison. What are we going to do? But prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. And when Herod would have brought him forth the same night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. We're going to have to switch Bibles real quick. Verse number six. And when Herod would have brought him forth, the same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him. That night, Herod was going to take him. They're praying for him. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side. Hey. And raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly. And his chains fell from his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself, and bind on thy sandals. So he did. By the way, that's a great verse when I'm trying to get my wife to uh, let me wear flip-flops everywhere. I say, hey, if Peter did it, coming out of prison, it's good enough for me. So, hey. But that's just me. And so he did. The angel's like, get up. We got to go. Peter's like, okay, I guess so. Like, so he's getting ready. And so he did. And he saith unto him, cast thy garment about thee and follow me. And he went out and followed him and wist not that it was true. He thinks he's dreaming. Which was done by the angel, but though he saw, but thought he saw a vision. When they were past the first and the second ward... Like, they're passing, like, all where these guards are. Like, they're going through. I mean, this is prison, like, down in the thing, right? So they're coming out. They're, they're walking past all these wards where the guards are kept, where people are. And look what happens. They come unto the iron gate that leadeth unto the city and open to them of his own accord. And they went out and passed on through one street and forthwith the angel departed from him. So the angel leads him out and says, we're going to go through here, we're going to go through there. And then they walk out and Peter's like, and you're like, right here, get your, get your stuff on, let's go. I mean, and, and then the iron gate to the city's open. And the angel's like, hey, you got it from here, I'm out of here. <laughs> and like, the angel leaves, the angel departs. I'd be like, you stay here. Like, I mean, anyway, that's what I was thinking. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, now I know of a surety 
that the Lord hath sent his angel and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. Praying. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a damsel came to, came to hearken named Rhoda. She's famous throughout all of eternity for world history for one thing. When she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. Peter, we're so glad you're here. <laughs> and she takes off. And they said unto her, thou art mad. She says, Peter's outside. But she constantly affirmed that it was even so. Would have been easier if she just let him in, but hey. Then they said, it is his angel. So they think, oh, Peter's dead. They think it's a ghost. They think whatever. Can you blame them? I mean, can you be like, James is killed by the sword. They take Peter. For all they know, he's dead that night. Like, that's what's supposed to be happening. But Peter continued knocking. When they had opened the door, they saw him. They were astonished. But he, beckoning unto them with the hand to hold their peace, declared unto them how the Lord had brought him out of prison. And he said, go show these things unto James and to the brethren and he departed and went into another place and it keeps going and it keeps going uh, and some different things happen and one of the neat things that happened there is that uh, Herod gets all mad that Peter's gone and that the whole thing's happening and Herod kind of sets him up all, all prima donna type you know sits himself up in his palace and uh, the Bible says and Herod arrayed in a royal apparel sat upon his throne and made an oration unto them. And the people gave a shout saying, it is the voice of a God and not of a man. We're saying that about old fat Herod. And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him because he gave not God the glory and he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. So Herod's gone out of the picture. God took care of that. Amen and amen. So all these things happened. And I read that part about Herod just because I like that part. <laughs> yeah, we, it's nice to see old Herod get taken out. Uh, amen. But in all these things, what happened? Verse 24, but the word of God grew and multiplied. The word of God grew and multiplied. This morning, it is recorded in scripture by Dr. Luke that prayer has power. There are prayers that when we sit down and we focus to our Heavenly Father and we say, God, I can't do this. I need you. He looks up. Because we spend a lot of this life thinking we can do it ourselves, do we not? I can do this, I can do that, I have enough money for this, I can make that happen, I can work hard, and, and we should push hard. We should work hard. Nobody's not saying that. But folks, there's things on a different pay grade. And there are times and, and many times and consistent times that we must go to our Heavenly Father to pray. Amen. To pray for our nation. To pray for our world to pray for our brothers and sisters in church, to pray for our church and its leaders, to pray for our families, to pray for our community, to pray for people to get saved, things that we can't do Amen. without God. And in this scenario, where James is killed by the sword, and Peter's literally taken, they get together and they do something very powerful. Something so powerful that not even the Roman guards, not even the guards that were appointed, nobody could stop it. And it was that God reached his hand down, sent an angel, and changed everything because they prayed. We have been praying consistently for a situation. We had see, many situations across our church. Health and people, and all sorts of stuff. But one today that we are celebrating is that God brought the Sanchez family home to us. Amen. We prayed. We asked God, did we not? Right. We believed. We said, God, we know you have a plan. We never doubted. Right. 
The Sanchez's never doubted. They said God must have a plan. They took step after step, and we have literally watched. They watched God literally bring Peter back to their presence. A little bit different situation, granted. But no less powerful. In that God brought them back to us. Using the power of prayer and and belief of some churches and belief of some Christians and saying, God, would you work in this situation? And what do you know he did? Ladies and gentlemen, little things can have a huge impact. There's a bunch of people that on Friday, driving south, they all glanced left. And it stopped up the whole works. What if some people prayed and kept on praying fervently? The Word of God teaches that those little chunks of prayer have a huge impact. So this morning, we can either choose to be one or two people. We can be the people that are always looking left. What's happening? Maybe that's the solution. And it stops up the works. We look right. Oh, what's going? Oh, maybe that's the solution. Or we can believe the, or we can be the people that believe the word of God, Amen. and say, "I'm going to pray. I'm going to believe. I'm going to put one foot in front of the other. I'm going to keep trusting God, knowing that what He says will come to pass. That truly is prayers of power." At this time, we're going to go ahead and have our special this morning. Then we'll have another song and then our closing message this morning. But think this morning of the power of prayer. Amen. That's right. Awesome. i
God, thank you, Pastor House. Let's stand again. We're going to sing, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. We'll sing the first, the third, and the last this morning. If you're saved this morning, praise the name of Jesus with us on the first verse. God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated this morning. Thank you, Pastor Stewart. I appreciate that. A great message, too. I just want to leave you with a couple of thoughts this morning. If you would turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 1. 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 1. And instead of reading this portion of scripture, let me just give you the background of it and then and then we'll close. We want to give uh we would like to give a gospel message with this as well, because there's a lot to be said about prayer. And uh, Pastor Stewart did a good job about showing us the purpose of prayer and some of the results that can happen with prayer. We've got to see that in our church. And if you haven't been involved or plugged in, you don't get to see that on a day-to-day basis. I do believe that it builds your faith. I love what was brought out in the last message about the idea of uh, that the word of God multiplied. Sometimes we think that, well, if we if we preach a really intellectual message, or or we we give the best points, or we really we really give you know uh, uh, just a, a good argument or a good debate or a, or a good lecture, or even sometimes a good pep rally on on some scriptural basis. That boy, that's really going to turn people's hearts and. You know, the Bible says it's through the foolishness of preaching. We understand that, it, that that's the power of God, but we also have to understand this. Nothing speaks like results. Nothing speaks like results. And, and when, when you have people coming together and praying and God answering that prayer, it says something. It, you can't argue against that. I, I remember as a child watching my, my parents and, we, we always had this, um, we had a family devotion we would do, we'd sit down, and then my parents would have all of us pray. And I used to drive me nuts as a kid, I didn't like it. But I, we had, and he always knew, like before we knelt down, because my mom was the longest prayer, and I always had this, I always had this, this philosophy that because she couldn't preach, she was going to use that prayer as an opportunity because you always knew, too, if she was upset with you by the way she prayed. And it would be like, too, and it would be long. So it would be like if, if she was upset with Chris or she was upset with Steve or me or whatever, it would be like, and we all knew it, it would be like, we'd look at each other, me and my brothers, and we'd be like, you know we're in for it. This is going to be long. And I remember one time I got in trouble and my brothers were like, thanks a lot. You know what's coming, you know? <laughs> And, uh, and so we kind of had this thing, we would jo- we'd joke around, but you knew you were in trouble, but you also got to hear her heart. 
uh, because she would pray and, and she would pray for specific things. And, and, you know, you miss out when you don't pray and you don't pray with people. And you, you don't hear. Husbands, you miss out when you don't hear your wife pray. Uh, I like hearing my wife pray. pray. I like the things that she says. I, I'm always blown away. For me, it's not even necessarily hearing her pray. Is looking at her prayer list. She really irritates me because, like, what will happen is she'll have this prayer list. The other day, no joke, she's doing homeschooling with one of our girls. And she calls me and she goes, Darren, come here, come here, come here, look at this. I'm, like, looking at it, and there are these prayer requests that she had been praying for. And I'm reading these names, and they were names that, man, I hadn't heard for years. And, and, and like, something will happen, and my wife will be like, oh, she was on my prayer list. Like, oh, you stole another one from me. A lot of times, like, prayer will be answered. I'll have this prayer answered, and I'll think, oh, you know, I was praying for this, and I didn't tell anybody. And she'll be like, oh, I was praying for that, too. I'm like, and then I have to wonder, is God listening to me? Is he listening to her? Or what? You know, I play these, we play these mind games with each other. But prayer does some things. It, it does some things that are unique. And I want to show you one of those things that it does. But sometimes, like, we look at, oh, we pray, and, and Peter, I mean, look at what it did for Peter. Look at what it did for all those people. But have you ever considered what else prayer does? Do you ever feel separated from the group? Look at this, 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 1. Look at what the Bible says. And it came to pass after this also that the children of Moab and the children of Ammon and with them other besides the Ammonites came against Jehoshaphat to battle. Then there came some that, uh, some that told Jehoshaphat, saying, There cometh a great multitude against thee from beyond the sea on this side, Syria. And behold, they be in Hazaz Tamer which is in Gedi. And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord, but look at what he does, and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. And Judah gathered themselves together to ask help of the Lord. Even out of the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. And Jehoshaphat stood in the congregation of Judah in Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court. And you can read the rest of it, but, but you, get, you get the scene. You get what's going on here is this, this enemy has come. They're afraid. They don't know what to do. And all of the sudden, we see all of the people coming together. I'm going to tell you something that prayer has often done for me. It's done for my family. It's done for those that I often feel close to in the church. And, and it, it, it often helps a church. It draws them together. You know, for a while we would get up and we were praying and, and, and all I had to do was say, man, keep praying for Teresa Glass. And everyone would be like, amen, amen. And every time we'd get a report in the men's prayer about uh, God doing something or how things went, it would, it would be, or we'd hear Brother Don, it would be like, we, it brought everyone together. Right. We were praying for charity and, and we were praying for the Sanchez's. Man, this past year has been tough. We had all these people saved, but we went through all these trials too. I remember distinctly Daniel calling me and we were talking about the whole situation with his citizenship and the whole thing. And I told him, I said, brother, I think you ought to just bite the bullet. He's like, you, you think so, pastor? I'm like, I do. I think it sounds like, you know, you've put the time in, you've got an attorney because you can always trust a good attorney. And, um, <laughs> I'm like, you put the time in, and, 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 and I think that it sounds like this whole thing's working out. He's like, you know, the thing is, if I go down there, Pastor, I might not be able to come home. And they can extend this thing out for two years. And then, you know, we had talked about it, and I think we talked about it twice. By the time we, we talked about it the second time, I told him, you know, hey, you know, nah, don't worry about it. Man, God's got this. He's got this. And I remember saying that specifically. God's got this. And then he goes down there, and it's like the whole, the bottom fell out from us. I'm like, Lord, what are you doing? What are you doing? Do you know there were a lot of things God did during the last several months? 
Number one, uh, if you ask Daniel and Shelby at the time, I felt horrible. For a long time, I felt bad. I'm like, man. I'm like, I, I went to the hospital bedside of Teresa, and I'm like, Teresa, I really think God's going to bring you. She was really down, and she was like, if God calls me home, I'm ready to go. And I'm like, I'm not ready for you to go. I said, I think God's going to bring you out of this. And, and she, she was like, she, she told me, she's like, well, you know, Pastor, and well, let's see what the Lord does. And we played songs and we sang and we had fun. And I left with all this confidence. And, and I'm just like, God's going to do something here. And, and then things did start turning up. And, and I, I had all this, all this exuberance, all this excitement. And, 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 and then the situation with Daniel happened. And then charity. And then it was just like, oh, man. Have you ever considered those sometimes? Parents will do things to their children to bring them together. I, there have been times, and I'm sure my parents did it. I don't remember specific times, but I know that there were times we did work. But I do remember specifically hearing one parent in, in particular. His kids were fighting, and so he just put them to work. So, all right, there's the yard work. You guys got all this energy. Let's go do that. Let's go do that. They were so irritated with their dad that they started working together, trying to get these jobs done, and pretty soon it coalesced them together. And, you know, I remember in basketball, our coach would, he, he had us run lines in a certain way that instead of just the person that was first being able, what he did was we had a time. It, he timed us. And, and it got to the point with the time that he didn't stop the clock until the last person crossed. And if we didn't make, I can't remember what the seconds were, but if we didn't make it, then we all had to run lines again. Now, at first, everyone got irritated with the guy that was at the end. But pretty soon what started happening is that, you know, because our center was a big guy. He couldn't run like the 5'9 guard could. And, and so what started happening is people started like helping him. They started cheering him on. And his name was Paul. We're like, come on, Paul, you got it. You got it. You can do it. Let's go. And then I remember the first time Paul made the time, everybody was cheering. Yeah. Woo. You may have been in this church for the past six years and you really didn't know the Sanchez family. But now everybody in the church knows the Sanchez family. How sad it is that there are some of us maybe that are in here that know of Daniel more leaving for six months to Mexico than we did when he was here for years as a member right next to us. We prayed for him more. Maybe this was a lesson for you and I that it's time for us to draw together and do something worthwhile. And praying is worthwhile. Praying is something that brings God's people together. And King Jehoshaphat, man, this is coming. And I'm sure there were times he's sitting on the throne. He was actually one of the few good kings. And he knew it. He knew it when he went to Israel. One of their prophets said, the only reason why I'm even coming is because of King Jehoshaphat. He's a decent guy. Ahab was, he was a, 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 a heathen, a total heathen. And Jehoshaphat knew that he loved the Lord. He knew what was important. And, and maybe there were those times where he sat down and, and he's sitting on the throne. He gets this news and he gets that news. And then pretty soon he gets news from across the scene. He's like, every time he turns around, something's falling apart. Job probably felt the same way. It's like, why is this happening? There are all obviously different reasons for all of that stuff. but. When we consider Peter in prison, maybe one of the reasons why that had to happen is God said, you know, it's time for the church to come together and pray. It's time for God's people to come together and pray. It's time for God's people to forget about everything going on in their lives and start worrying about somebody else's. And so Jehoshaphat calls an assembly 
and he tells everyone, he proclaims prayer and he proclaims a fast. It's tragic to me that there are Christians that have lived their whole life and they've never fasted. They've never prayed and fasted. They've never had that kind of focus on praying or committing a day to God in prayer that they've never experienced fasting in their life. And yet, prayer is one of the most powerful tools that any of us have. I think one of the reasons why is I don't think we, many of us think it's as powerful of a tool as it is. But two years became six months. And if you ask Daniel and Shelby, they'll tell you God had a purpose in it. I remember the first conversation me and Daniel had. Daniel said, you know, Pastor, God's got a reason for this. I'm like, dude, I am so sorry. I, I don't know what happened. I, you start looking at things, and you start even questioning yourself. You're like, man, that, do I, am, I, am I messed up? Am I messing these people up? And you know, God took Teresa home. He answered the prayer. No more pain. He answered the prayer. It wasn't the way that I wanted it to go. And he kept Charity alive. She's doing well. God brought the Sanchez's back. Prayer works. Prayer works. I want to just leave you with this thought. Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 15. This is God's answer. It's not always like this, but this one's pretty good. So finally, God tells him, hey, I'm going to take care of this. They've prayed, they've fasted, they've given it to the Lord. In 2 Chronicles 20, verse 15, the Bible says, And he said, Hearken ye, all Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou King Jehoshaphat, thus saith the Lord unto you, Be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude. For the battle, the battle is not yours. I've told my kids this when I think at some point in time after my two oldest have been married, there's always financial things that come up. You know, and, and I, as I was just talking to one of my sons here recently and he was, we were talking about it and I told him, I said, are you going to church? Yeah. Are you praying? Yeah. Are you, are you giving? Yeah. Are you serving God? Not perfectly, but are you serving God? Yeah. This problem isn't yours. It's his. It's his problem. You know, when I was a kid growing up, I didn't stress out about the water bill. I didn't stress out about the electricity. You know why? It wasn't my problem. And you know, so many of us, we live this life, we're stressed out about things. Hey, money is tight right now for a lot of people. And it's not going to get better. The economy is tanking. But listen, are you serving God? Is your faith in Him? It's His problem. Now, while mom and dad were paying the electricity and they were paying the water, there were times there was, there was some instruction that took place. Me and my brother had this joke, especially after basketball and football practice. We like to take what was referred to as the half-hour power shower. My dad reminded us very quickly, stop it. You're not doing that. And one of the reasons why we took some liberties on that is because we didn't have to worry about it. I think about it a whole lot more now as an adult. But when I was growing up, I didn't, it was no big deal. It's like, what is his problem? Well, he's paying the bill. And you know what? Just because our, our problems, if we're faithful, are God's problems, it doesn't mean that you and I should be unwise. If you go out and you go buy a $100,000 Corvette, and you go, it's God's problem how this is going to get paid. 
Okay, that's foolish. That's not what I'm talking about. But the problems that we face in life in the circumstances, if we're being faithful and we're being reasonably, we're having some reasonable stewardship, it, it does become God's problem. And even sometimes the dumb decisions that we make, if we turn those things around, we give them to God and we start being faithful, we start being good stewards, we start doing the right things, it does become, God takes care of those. Doesn't mean it's going to be painless, but he takes care of those. I didn't worry about food growing up either. Mom and dad always paid for them. But my mom had this thing she did to us. We called them mystery meals when we were kids. And my dad, fortunately, my dad hated them worse than any of us kids did. Because we'd be like, what's that? That was always a bad indication at my house. When my dad looked at a plate of food and said, what is that? You knew it wasn't going to go well. And my mom always tried them anyway. We never could fully grasp that and understand that. So there were those times, and sometimes it was because there were leftovers or grocery budgets were tight or things were going on that, that were tight, but we never stressed out about it. It wasn't our problem. Mom and dad did those things. There were caveats in that. Listen, there's caveats in life. There's trials that come. King Jehoshaphat is going, I'm doing everything I know to do that's right. Now this foe's up against me. And God says, I know you what you're doing is right. He says, this isn't your problem. This is mine. Listen to the rest of this. He says, tomorrow, go ye against them. Behold, they come up by the cliff of Ziz, and ye shall find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jurel. Ye shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves, stand ye still, and see the salvation of the Lord with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. Verse 27, we see what happens. Then they returned every man of Judah and Jerusalem and Jehoshaphat in the forefront of them to go again to Jerusalem with joy. Well, this is afterwards. Um, with joy, for the Lord had made them to rejoice over their enemies, and they came to Jerusalem with psalteries, harps, trumpets, unto the house of the Lord. This is what you and I should be and do after God answers prayer. That's why, that's why services like this are important. It's not about the Sanchez's. It's not about celebrating that. What we're doing today, although we are celebrating that, but what we're doing today is we're saying God, thank you. Yes. Amen. And, and what happens and what I'm noticing more and more, and, and, and me and Brother Harding has talked about this in men's prayers, how many times our prayer sheet changes because God answers these prayers and then the new set comes in and we haven't even given him his due for what he just did, what he just answered. There are people that are in our church right now that have jobs that they didn't have. They have health that they didn't have. My dad is, is alive past what he was told he was going to live. And not only is he alive past that, but he's doing well. Amen. And, and, and there's so many different things. We have people in our, in our church that, that shared and just got a job. We've been praying for that. And, and we've seen that happen over and over and over again. We've seen God answer prayer. Prayer does more than give us results. It should bring us together in praising the Lord. My question for you is this today. Are you seeing the results of prayer? If you're not, no wonder you're bored by it. You're uninterested in it. If you're here and you've never, you've, you've never, you don't know God. You've never accepted his gift of eternal life. Maybe you find yourself here. Maybe you even have visited our church a few times. And you're like, what is this salvation thing? What is this relationship? What is this power of prayer? Hey, there's a prayer today I would love for you to be able to grab onto. And it's this one right here. See, he said, 
In 2 Chronicles 20, verse 17, God says to them, you shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves, stand ye still, and see the salvation of the Lord. See, there was a battle that you need to fight. If you're here and you don't know Christ, but you can't. Because it was already a battle that's been fought and won. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross. Jesus Christ took your sins. And today I'd say this, not stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. But today, Pastor Stewart is going to be up here. I'm going to be up here. We'd love to show you from the scriptures how you can know for sure that you have a home in heaven. That you can stand still and you can see the salvation of the Lord. How does that happen? Well, there's another prayer. It's not the prayer that saves you. It's faith in God, but Romans 10, 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Jehoshaphat goes, man, I'm facing a foe I can't beat. And God says, the battle's mine. Mankind is facing a foe it can't beat. The foe is sin. But 2,000 years ago, the battle became his. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Listen, if you're here and you don't know for sure that you have a home in heaven, would you come see one of us? We would love to. That My wife is in here, and, uh, and, and we can, or we can have one of the other ladies take you, if you're a lady, take you into the side room, show you from the scriptures how you can know for sure that you have a home in heaven. Over 2,000 years ago, close to, close to 3,000 years ago, Jehoshaphat saw the salvation of the Lord. You can see the salvation of the Lord in your own life today. In church, we need more Sundays like this. We need more days where we count the blessings. We need more days where we look at the prayers that God has answered, and we praise him for those. Jehoshaphat got it right. Jehoshaphat got it right. The people in Acts, when Peter shows up, they got it right. They praised the Lord. And as a result, the, the, the word of God spread. Man, if we had that attitude, it'd be better than any afternoon service we could ever have in this church. Let's have every head bowed and every eye closed. With every head bowed and every eye closed, we're going to have a, an invitation. If you're here and you're visiting with us, you're here, you don't know for sure you have a home in heaven, you don't know for sure that you've ever accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, we would love to show you from the scriptures how you could know for sure. And it's, it's not joining a church. We can't save you. We needed God to save us. It's, it's not going through a ceremony. Baptism can't save you. No good work. It's through Jesus Christ. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You know, another good opportunity for a church to come together and pray is right after a message right here at the altar. Father, we pray that you'd be with this invitation. We place it in your hand. Lord, we are so thankful for the prayers we've seen answered this year. And Lord, we, we pray, Father, that you would just, uh, so thankful that the Sanchez's sit here is a testimony to that. But God, we do pray, Father, that you would help us to be more faithful in this tool. Help us, Lord, to come together and, Lord, come to you in prayer. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand together, complete in thee. I love this song, complete in thee. As we sing, if the Holy Spirit has spoke to your heart, the altars are open.
second service. I wonder, um, could we do uh, Thank You, Lord? Just sing that song, Thank You, Lord, Thank You, Lord. And just uh, in, in kind of in, in cold, with the messages that were preached today on prayer and coming together, I think that, you know, it's uh, when, when Peter came back, man, the, the, people were amazed. They were excited. They got to see what God had done. When Jehoshaphat experienced it, the Bible says that they, they sang praises to God. And I, I just, you know, oftentimes Pastor Stewart will get up here and he'll say, hey, let's give God a hand and let's, but I, I would like to ask us if we would just sing this song from our heart. Think about all the prayers God answered for you this year. And then we're going to sing, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. God has done so many things. And I know all of us in here are going through something that often takes our focus off of that. We're going through something. Uh, maybe it's an irritating neighbor. Uh, maybe it's a, a frustrating spouse or, or children. We all can, we all, we all, anyone who's a parent knows what that's like. We all have things we're going through. But you know, there are so many things God's done for us today. Let's thank Him. Amen. Let's close in prayer. Brother Glass, would you ask the Lord to close us in prayer? Father, we do thank you so very much. <coughs> Father, for the messages that we heard this day, Lord, I do pray that you help us to take them to our hearts and our minds, Lord, that we may meditate upon your word. Father, I do pray that we will, each and every one of us, I pray that, Lord, that Bless the food that we're about to receive to our bodies, Lord. Just guide and direct each and every one of us as we go our separate ways, Lord. And those that are going to be staying and playing back volleyball, Lord, I pray, Father, for their safety and health. Lord, I thank you. In Jesus' precious name, amen. amen. amen.